So we're just about to start. Um, I'm Dan Thomas from the United Nations Global Compact in New York. We're just waiting for uh, one of the panelists to join us. Thank you for joining us, and we'll we'll begin in a in a little a little while. Uh, in the in the meantime, it's always interesting to see who's uh, who's joining these uh, these calls. Uh, we've had uh, a very global audience over the last uh, five weeks uh, broadcasting this session. I'm seeing uh, I'm seeing people joining from uh, Copenhagen and Kenya. Thank you so much for for joining us. Uh, we have uh, colleagues from Lebanon, Bangkok, Austria, Spain, Scotland, uh, India as well. Thank you for joining us from India. Uh, we have colleagues from Ghana and Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Italy, London, Costa Rica, Mongolia. Thank you for joining us from Mongolia. It must be rather late there. Florida, USA, Taiwan. It's also late in Taiwan and the Philippines. Uh, from Switzerland, Breckenridge, Colorado in this country. Uh, where I am in, in the United States. Thank you so much. Uh, Berlin has joined us as well, and Ecuador. So thank you all very much indeed uh, for joining us. Um, good evening uh, to Asia. Good afternoon in Europe and Africa. Good morning from the Americas. Thank you for joining us. The, this is the fifth installment of our special academy series focused on uniting business to respond to COVID-19 I'm Dan Thomas, the Chief Communication Officer for the United Nations Global Compact, and we're thrilled to continue to hear from so many extraordinary leaders around the world and to be joined by thousands of people every week. Despite the time differences, we seem to be attracting a truly global audience, and we, we thank you all for your attention and interest. Just last week, the United Nations Secretary General warned that COVID-19 is a public health emergency that is fast becoming a human rights crisis. In today's Academy session, we'll be taking a closer look at the way this crisis is impacting human rights, why human rights must underpin all of our response and recovery efforts, and what business, government, uh, the UN system and civil society can and are doing to respect and protect human rights in the face of COVID-19. Today, we have a very distinguished lineup of speakers. Uh, Ms. Michelle Bachelet, the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, from the government of Bangladesh, His Excellency Anasil Haq, the Minister for Law, Justice and Parliamentary Affairs. He'll be uh, joining us. Oh, there you are, Minister. Thank you so much for joining us. And, uh, and, and last, but by no means least, uh, one of the UN Global Compact's most committed business leaders, Mr. Roberto Marquez, Executive Chair and the Group CEO of Natura & Co. Thank you so much to all of you for joining us. The UN Secretary General just released a uh, report on COVID-19 and human rights, in which he stated that human rights are key in shaping the pandemic response because they focus attention on the people suffering the most. It's clear that while the virus does not discriminate, its impacts do. So I'd like to start by asking each of you to reflect on the impact this crisis is having on human rights. And in your context, who are the most vulnerable? A high Commissioner, why don't we start with you? Well, thank you, Dan. I'm very happy to be here and have this conversation. Yes, indeed, the economic and social impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic is and will be of an unprecedented scale. And only a few short months uh, into the crisis, the, in the impact is already staggering. Because according to the ILO, for example, lockdown measures are affecting nearly 2.7 billion workers, uh, representing 81% of the global workforce. And business, of course, are facing loss of revenues and bankruptcies of an unprecedented scale, resulting, of course, in job losses for millions. And all societies include people who are marginalized and face difficulties accessing public information or accessing healthcare and other essential services for a variety of reasons. But many of the people who are most severely impacted by the, by the crisis are those who already were uh, 
were very, uh, I would say, severely impacted for other challenges in their daily struggle to survive. Because if you think on 2.2 billion people in the world, washing their hands regularly is not an option because they, they don't have adequate access to water. Or 1.8 billion people who are homeless, and we're telling them stay home or have inadequate homes, housing, uh, so physical distancing is impossible. And marginalization creates vulnerability. The, the crisis is revealing how uh, certain groups are disproportionately affected. For instance, through the overrepresentation on figures on infections and on death. Containment measures themselves have a disproportionate impact on the poorest population who can work from home or live at a subsistence level. The pandemic has uh, been most devastating for the lives, the health and well-being of older people, of people uh, with underlying medical conditions, people with disabilities, and those with lower socioeconomic status, a category that tracks closely with minority status in many countries. And the poor and uh, the vulnerable in our society are not only at greater risk from the virus itself, they are most severely affected by the negative impacts of needed measures to control it, but that they have unintended consequences. For example, those employed in the informal sector, disproportionately women, have little recourse to social protection or unemployment assistance, for example. A special attention needs to be paid to the marginalized and those in vulnerable situations. It is essential to address the widespread inequalities and discrimination that have made that some people are more vulnerable, both to the disease and to the economic and social impact. Um, of the response and we need to ensure that actions in the response but also in the recovery phase needs to take into consideration all these vulnerable and marginalized people as a business for instance this means paying special attention to day laborers non-contract workers temporary employees and those without social protection coverage who work in your supply chain for example many of them are women or from vulnerable groups and immediate assistance and support, including under lockdown measures, uh, can be a lifeline. Well, th thank you very much, High Commissioner. Um, uh, Minister Anastol Hug from Bangladesh, what's, what, what's, your, uh, what's the impact of the crisis having on human rights in, in your co country? And, and, and in your context, who are the most vulnerable here? Um, from our context, you see the most disadvantaged people are those who are workers, day laborers, and transport workers, and all kinds of uh, street children, abandoned uh, women, and, and also the, the Hijra community, because they work on a daily basis, and the, their work has been completely stopped because of the lockdown that we are in now since uh, March the 26th. Uh, what we are facing is that we have uh, a very great exposure so far as the garments industry is concerned. And most of our garment factories are now closed, except for a few which have been opened with all the precautions taken. But that too has been opened very recently. So we have about uh, 3 million garment workers uh, all over the country who are uh, now unemployed, who have gone home. Uh, and the other um, disadvantaged people, uh, as I said, are the agricultural workers. Because you see, uh, we have, during the harvest season, we have a, a migration of workers from one of our administrative districts to another district. But that has completely stopped now. Uh, as a the measure, measure that we have taken uh, to um, take advantage of the harvest season that we are going through now is we have mechanized it. And uh, those people, uh, the people who were supposed to work in the uh, paddy fields, are now rendered unemployed. So these are these are the people most impacted by the. Uh, coronavirus epidemic pandemic. Thank you, and uh, Minister, what what impact is this Am having on, on, on their on their rights? As yes, we, we can hear you very well, but uh, what impact is this having on their human thank rights? Thank you, thank you. Uh, you see, 
the government has for starting uh, from the first case which was detected on the 8th of march 2020 the government has started taking initiatives to help these disadvantaged population and we have the honorable prime minister has already uh, given a, a financial stimulus package the first one was to assist the garments workers and there was a 5000 crore taka uh, give, given to the garments factories to pay the salaries of the workers, even if they are not working. And that gives them a three month uh, cushion and they will be paid for three months uh, within this period. So they are being taken care of. The government is now under the social security net, now helping the poor disadvantaged people. And, and it has gone up to the rural areas where we are uh, providing for providing food for the hungry. And that means the workers, the most disadvantaged people that I have mentioned uh, earlier. So we are also uh, now focused on uh, providing for a more social safety networks. We have got the vulnerable group feeding program, the vulnerable group development program. The vulnerable group feeding program includes about 5 million people the vulnerable group development program of the Ministry of Child uh, and Women Affairs has about 1 million. So uh, we are providing food for the hungry. We are also taking care of the finance. There is a financial package which is providing them with TAKA 500 and TAKA 700, uh, which in terms of the Bangladeshi context is uh, at least a, a great help in this time of need when you have the food supplied by the government. So we are, uh, our prime minister, actually it's, it's gone. Our prime minister has already, I don't know we whether can, I'm connected or not. Yes, yeah. we can hear you minister, so, we can hear you very well. Please, yes. please continue. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's getting, uh, the thing is, that uh, our Honorable Prime Minister has already laid down that the programs that have been taken by the government will not stop till even after the coronavirus is over. We do not know the time, but the thing is that this package continues for three months and the other stimulus is for the industry, totally a taka, 72,750 crore taka, uh, crore, uh, stimulus package is there. One is for the industry. The other is for the small and medium enterprises. Then we have the for the garments industry, and finally for the agriculture sector. So we are the honourable prime minister is covering all the sectors, and this package will be available to them immediately and at a lesser rate of interest than given. We are also thank, thank you very much, uh, Minister. That's a, a very comprehensive answer, and you've you've, you've clearly uh, you've clearly made a lot of commitments there to uh, the, the people most uh, vulnerable. Um, if I could ask you, uh, Roberto Marcus, you're the, the group CEO of Natura and Co. Um, what are your reflections on the impact this crisis is having on on human rights, and in your context, who are the most vulnerable? Yeah, so then first, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to, to share the, this panel with the High Commissioner and the Minister. Uh, nice meeting you both virtually. Uh, listen, this it is an unprecedented crisis, right? So we are seeing uh, something that I, I don't think the world has ever seen in terms of the spread and the reach of the contagions, right? So uh, Natura & Co. is a company uh, that is present in over, you know, 100 countries. Uh, uh, and, and as you see today, uh, not only with our associates, but also with our representatives and consultants, over 6 million, we have, we have a very strong footprint in developing markets and in, in emerging markets, right? Uh, and, and we are seeing the impact, the human impact uh, it's having in our network, in our associates, 
So early on, we made a, a, a commitment to really put people first, uh, really prioritize the impact uh, across our network. So how we can protect them from job security to creating uh, initiatives to help them uh, navigate to the crisis. Um, using, using a phrase from Anita Roddick, uh, you know, the, the founder of uh, The Body Shop, uh, business can and should be a force for good. Uh, and in those uh, set of circumstances, I think it's so important that uh, business leaders and business in general working with governments, working with health authorities, working with the private sector, embrace that responsibility. And, and, and I think if we all do that as a call to action, I think we can and should you know, navigate to this crisis in, in the best possible way, right? So putting people first, understanding the impact of the crisis, understanding the reach of the contagious, and then really to your point, then how we, how we think about human rights, right? And, uh, and I go back to 1948, when the, the letter of uh, human rights was written at uh, UN, you know, in three waves, individuals, social and collective. I, I just wonder, and maybe it's something to consider as we come out of this crisis, if we should think about a fourth wave which is related to mankind, right? I think as we are seeing here, the importance of the collective, the importance of what you do impact me, what I do impacts you, right? Uh, uh, and how we think about the right of people to come and go, but in a safe way. How we think again, you know, to provide health, especially for the most vulnerable people. And we, as we see, as uh, uh, the High Commission mentioned, the virus doesn't discriminate, but unfortunately, it hits harder the more un underprivileged people. So how we think about providing health, how we think about uh, somehow addressing the inequality in a world that will be different coming out of this crisis. And we needed to think about this aspect of mankind. So might be a provocative thinking, but how we think about a potentially fourth wave uh, of human rights coming out of this crisis in a way that we think holistically about mankind. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Marquez. Um, High Commissioner, um, perhaps you could reflect on that, that interesting sort of idea about the, the importance of the collective, the rights of the, the collective. Um, how do you see, how do you see um, rights um, and the conversation about rights in this very difficult uh, pandemic emergency? Well, I think it's a great opportunity, eh, Dan, because uh, when I arrived here, I was surprised to see the, the I would say, the backslash on, on human rights. It was very difficult to put the discussion with, with the, in, in certain areas, with certain dimensions. Uh, human rights were considered like, um, Okay, only if it's possible, and 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 only and, and and we insisted that human rights are all of them, not only political and civil rights. It's also social, economic, cultural rights, right to a clean environment. Of course, uh, we are all, we have been working strongly with a lot of companies on digital technology, artificial intelligence, and human rights because new areas open also new questions. But I truly uh, agree with, with Roberto because so one of the things I've been asking myself is uh, when those moments that I tried to push hard on the human rights agenda, and it was very difficult. I usually said, not a joke, but certain comment like, if tomorrow we needed to approve the, the, the human rights um, universal declaration, maybe we wouldn't approve it in today's world. But so I think it's a great opportunity because it had meant people to, I, I hope that when we, I mean, we do not want to go back to normal the day before COVID-19. We need to learn the lessons because what the, the, the COVID-19 has done is to show something that we always knew, is that there are huge inequalities in the world and, the, and, and how much people with, with uh, more vulnerable groups are really don't have access to main basic issues. And of course, not access to healthcare, even in very powerful countries, I have to say. It shows also something that for me as a medical doctor, a physician, has always been clear is that investing in health is an investment, it's not a cost 
But for many years, the discussions at the economic level was, it's a cost, it's not an investment. But of course, we all know what's the more important thing in every country, it's the, the people. The, in, the, in the economic words, the human capital. So we need people to be in, in good conditions and with good health, with welfare, and with, with a good levels of education, et cetera, et cetera. But for many years, this was seen as a cost. And you can see that systems, health systems, were not completely prepared for something like this. So I do believe that we should learn lessons. We should understand the importance that we are all, and, and, and the Secretary General, the UN has always been saying, nobody's going to save himself by themselves. Here, uh, the, the, the best possibility for me is that everyone else is safe. And that's why when we talk about health, we need everyone to have access to health. So it is, um, I think it's an opportunity to look at what's really important, what's really relevant, and to look also how we are all interconnected in, in good ways, but also in, in, in with problems like the pandemics that can grow and grow and grow. But on the other hand, we need to ensure that we have climate action, that we uh, ensure biodiversity, because many of these huge pandemics all these last years, SARS, MERS, um, and others, are also zoonosis. They're transmitted from wild animal to domestic animal and domestic animal or, or to wild animal to human beings. So we need to, it's not only how we, I mean, when we start the recovery phase, we need to think on all these dimensions, the human rights dimensions in all this area, how we respect nature and we are able to ensure climate action because we need to find out that we have been in risk, that this is a year that we are in risk and this is a time to think deeper, what are the kinds, which, which is the kind of economy that we're gonna develop that can include the, the capacity of creating jobs, but also with more, uh, more uh, good labor conditions, which is the kind of a political system that can come, that could bring more, um, I would say, democratic spaces to, to the people who can participate or be part of the solutions. So I think it's uh, on, on climate action, on, on how we deal with all these intersecting problems, because when you look at the most vulnerable, you see that many of them are women, migrants or refugees, uh, LGBTI communities, indigenous group, etc. So people, older people, people with disabilities. So there's a lot of intersecting issues that means that those people, their human rights are really affected. So let's hope, I, I, I will, I, I mean, I'll describe myself as a, um, a strategic optimist. Let, uh, let me try to be a strategic optimist and think we need to come out better and we need to come out all together because that's the only way we're going to go through. Thank you. That, that's, a, that's a great answer. And we will come on to that future in, the, in a minute and building the resilience into the system. Um, uh, Minister Anasol Haq in, in Bangladesh, you heard, uh, you heard Roberto Marcus talk about um, how business leaders really should embrace their responsibilities. Um, in Bangladesh, are you finding, is the private sector supporting the government in the extraordinary steps you're taking to support the most uh, vulnerable, the workers who have lost their jobs. How has the private se sector uh, uh, stepped in to help? I, 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 thank you for, for this question. Uh, I, I must say that the private sector has come forward uh, and come forward very magnanimously to, uh, to share with the government this responsibility and uh, to help us uh, get over it. We, have, we are now fighting it together. The most important thing that this uh, pandemic has taught us is the fact that nobody can be left behind. One person left behind can also uh, be the fatal mistake that we will be making. So we are uh, now trying uh, to include everyone and not to leave behind anybody within this social net. Uh, I, I forgot to mention about the Rohingyas, where we are also making sure that these displaced person from Mi persons from Myanmar are getting the best of care possible within the network that we have. Uh, I must say that the private sector has taken into their uh, uh, fold the directions that have been given by the by our honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. They have. Uh, they have started their initiatives and now they are also working not only 
through the charitable ways, but they are participating with the government in helping the vulnerable group, the most disadvantaged groups, to get over this crisis. And we really appreciate this, and we think and we hope that they will be carrying out, they will be with us all along this as we tra travel these difficult times. Thank you, Minister. Um, Mr. Marquez, one of the primary actions that the UN is calling on businesses to take is to, to repurpose their facilities and their business plans to focus on meeting the needs of this crisis. At Natura & Co, you've not only done exactly that, you've also taken a step further, I believe, to service those in need and to provide them with the necessary resources. Can you tell us a little bit about the steps that you've taken as a business and, uh, and what, what did you have to consider in, in the process? Yeah, a very good question, Dan. And again, I'm, I'm very proud to, to share that the work uh, that's been done with a lot of passion and enthusiasm by our, by our colleagues and associates. But again, as I said, our first priority has been to put people first, but the second has been how we better serve the communities and how we can better serve the societies where we operate. We know, for example, that as part of our portfolio across our uh, brands, Natura, Avon, uh, Body Shop, and Easel, we produce one product that is critical to fight the virus, which is soap. So we actually have redirect production across our manufacturings globally to increase the production of essential products and partner with other companies to produce hand sanitizers, alcohol gel, increase production of our uh, essential products by over 30% in a very short period of time, converting manufacturing to make sure that not only we can provide that to our network, but also collaborate with health authorities and donating. Up to this point, and we have donated over 10 million units of soaps, alcohol gel, and hand sanitizers, and will continue to do so especially in the areas of underprivilege where people in hospitals and local authorities uh, need the most. So uh, it is uh, one example of a, a, a situation where understanding how we can contribute and understanding that as part of our portfolio, we have essential products that are so important right now for the circularity of the economy, but also to help uh, we've been stepping up and we've been redirecting manufacturing and production to increase our capacity on those items. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. It's, it's really, uh, really encouraging to hear. Um, before, we turn, before we turn to our questions from our audience, and there'll be many, uh, many questions from a really, truly global audience of people watching around the world. And thank you for your attention and, and interest. Um, let me just ask each of you to reflect on, um, you know, how can business use the lessons we're learning now to guard against human rights violations in future crises? I mean, how can we how can we build more resilience into the system so that we're better prepared for this uh, this kind of situation that we we find ourselves in? Um, uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, why don't you kick us off? Well, thank you. As I, as, as I mentioned before, I think the crisis has highlighted shortcomings in respect for human rights that have uh, fundamentally weakened the global and, and national response. Uh, but we need to keep an eye on the future, as you said, and, 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 and we develop our, as, as we at the same time are developing our short-term responses. I think the lessons uh, they learned from, and probably we will have more lessons to learn because this was unfortunately it's not gonna end too soon, uh, is uh, can lead us to a more peaceful, just, inclusive and resilient societies uh, where we can deliver on the promise of the 2030 agenda through the SDGs and the Global Compact has been working with companies to ensure that the agenda 2030 is also how the business can help on that agenda as well. Um, the, the other thing is that um, when the crisis is over, um, the international community will need to redouble its efforts to ensure access to, to health and, and including the target of universal health coverage and strengthening the capacity of all countries for early warning, for risk reduction, management of national and global health risk. And I think in all these responses, Roberto mentioned it in some way, saying how business can work more with uh, 
governments, with public authorities, with uh, health sector, but also I would say when we're looking at the recovery of the economy and the job losses and how to deal with the risk now to, of a closure, but then how to restart the economy afterwards, I will also say that this tripartite way of working an ILO with when you include businesses, but you also include trade unions and governments, it can make try to find ways of, of looking at good practices and, and following those good practices. So the impact on, on people and also on work on, on companies, in particular medium and small companies, but also on workers is not that that big. I think we, we need to continue tackling uh, inequalities that exist there. We need to ensure uh, better labor conditions and, and we need to have respect, as I mentioned before, and companies here also have to play a, a role, important role on climate action and protecting biodiversity through ensuring good sources of clean energy. Um, so we need to work in, in a different way as well. I think one of the things that uh, I think has been one of the biggest messages of the UN, but I'm not sure it has really, really gone through is that when you have a pandemic, you need global cooperation, you need global solidarity, because everyone depends on the other. And unfortunately, we have not seen that yet so much. Every country has been managing its own issue by themselves, not in a coordinated way. And that is not only not the more efficient way, we understand every government needs to ensure the people's life. But the problem is that we, if they don't do it in a coordinated way, uh, it, ha it might happen that the, 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 the pandemic can rebound, can come back again. So what we need to, I would say it's also a, a very important moment to understand the importance of multilateralism, why we need to work all together because the challenges are not one country challenges, are challenges uh, for the whole world. And in this sense, the same international cooperation with businesses it is, is very important. There is a good alliance on vaccines that are working public, private, uh, labs, uh, WHO, another, uh, Gabi, and other organizations. And I think that, um, that that's the, the more important thing, that, that we go through all of this together. And, and that's the only way to ensure that we don't go back to another, uh, I don't know if to say second wave, but at least the rebound of, of, of the pandemic. Thank you very much, High Commissioner. Uh, Minister Haq in, in Bangladesh, I mean, how, how do you think uh, business can use the lessons we're learning so that we can guard against uh, human rights violations in, in the future? I, I think the most important thing while agreeing with the High Commissioner, I, I would say that, you see, uh, now the private sector should come up with a partnership with the government about, uh, you know, the social security measures uh, for, for their workers and also the health security part. Because uh, we, we by this pandemic we have understood that this kind of waves uh, can start and and we we become paralyzed when it it does start. So the second time around, if God forbid this kind of things happen, we are better prepared to handle the Christ the human right crises that this kind of pandemic starts. For example, if uh, the private sector has a, a proper social security net within the uh, industry that they work. In that case, we will be able to uh, at least help those who will become unemployed. They will, not, they will not fall back on the government as they are falling back now. So if we have that kind of partnership, in that case, I think we will be better off uh, in facing any other crises that, that might come up. And when we are talking about recovery, we must also uh, think that this kind of partnership is essential to uh, make a speedy recovery from what, what we are facing today. I don't know when it will end, but I am hoping, uh, as the High Commissioner has said, that she is a strategic optimist, I am a practical optimist, and I would like that uh, this, I would pray that this is over. And once it is over, then we will need a partnership of a very big scale whereby we can all be united globally and also nationally to overcome the, the problems, the uh, trage tragedies that this pandemic has caused. Thank you. 
Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Minister. Thank you, and thank you for that view. It's really so interesting to have uh, a, a country like yours uh, as part of these discussions. Um, uh, uh, Roberto, um, why don't why don't you reflect a little bit on 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 how business can use the lessons we're learning? How can we how can we recover stronger, recover uh, together? How can we build resilience into our into our system? Yeah, no, I would first add that I, I could not agree more with the High Commission and the Minister in the way I think they, they, they share their, their points of view. I, I think there are a couple of words that comes to mind, and I think in terms of lessons learned and how we needed to think about this new norm, uh, one is uh, partnerships, right? And how can we uh, enhance partnerships between private sectors and, and public sectors and, and, and health authorities and local authorities. Uh, second that comes to mind is uh, a more coordinated approach. I, I, I think, you know, High Commissioner mentioned, well, it, it does feel that every country, uh, every municipality is still trying to figure that out. And how can we work more as a collective? I think the power of the collective in dealing with situations like this global pandemic is so critical. And, and, and I do also think that especially the people running for public uh, offices needed to step back a little bit. And, and, and I do see a lot of political elements playing into initiatives. And, and, and I think there is a call to action to almost like put that in second and third priority and really focusing on right now what we are talking about, you know, lives and human beings and how we needed to think about what I think uh, the High Commissioner mentioned, which is the human capital. The world cannot exist without human capital. And we need to protect that and do everything we can to really uh, uh, defend that uh, and, and how we needed to think about it. And, and my last point, is I also think that there is an opportunity being also a, a, a kind of optimistic sense. I, I think coming out of this crisis, we have an opportunity to double down on and how we think about the climate crisis, how we think about some of the actions that we might need to take uh, uh, coming out of this uh, situation and how, what are the things that we need to put even more emphasis. And you heard about biodiversity, which is very, uh, uh, very dear to us with all the work that we do with the Amazon forest, etc. So how we how we leverage biodiversity, uh, how we leverage a situation where we 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 make the commit commitments of the uh, agenda 2030 more uh, uh, front and center with the business leaders and the collective with between private sector and government. So I, I do think then that there's going to be, uh, despite this being such a, a brutal impact in society, in lives, in the economy, there's going to be some lessons learned that if we take to the heart uh, and really act collectively, I think we can come out of that even stronger as society and as individual, as business and as government. Thank you very much indeed. In inspiring, uh, inspiring words. Um, so now we're gonna we're gonna move to questions. We've got a number of questions coming in from our from our audience. Uh, Minister Hack in in Bangladesh, maybe I can ask you to reflect on on this and and the others as well. The question that we're receiving from many people is how multinational corporations can um, you know ensure human rights are protected across their supply chains. Uh, what's your experience in Bangladesh of, of how multinational uh, organizations, companies are, are reacting and, uh, and in particular with regard to human rights? You, you, you see, uh, the most important thing that we are facing now is in, in, in the way of getting uh, canceled orders. Orders are being canceled right, left and center. So I will make an appeal through you and through this uh, the compact that you see, uh, we are ready if uh, within a very short time, I guess, and I pray that we will be ready to, uh, our to start our industries and, and basically the garments factories. And if the orders that has had been placed, that has been placed earlier 
if they are kept there, in that case, they will be actually helping human rights in the, in the way that these workers will come back to work and their basic needs will be answered once they, they start working. So I will, uh, the multinationals have a very big role to play in this. And as I said, I will borrow this word from uh, the uh, high commissioner saying that there must be a, a global effort. And, and when we are talking about the global effort and Roberta's collective effort, we, we are talking about such kind of assistance that they come forward without canceling the orders so that we can all participate in the recovery system. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, Roberto Marquez, uh, here's a question which is uh, coming in from a number of people as well. Um, the role of business has already been, uh, you know, challenged as a, a question of, you know, who, who the priority is, what the purpose of, of business is in society. Um, uh, do you think this pandemic is a final step for business to prioritize stakeholders over shareholders? Uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely. We, uh, you know, we've been saying that for uh, for many years. The importance of balance, what we call, you know, the triple bottom line, right? We always embrace that. It is about, you know, putting, you know, society, stakeholders, uh, putting the environment, and and putting shareholders, but not just thinking about the shareholders. And and I think. Uh, I, I'm very pleased to see many companies uh, doing that, and, and I think it will be a, a step change of corporations, multinationals, in terms of uh, understanding their role in society, which is, again, if we don't defend you know, the human capital, if we don't defend the environment, there is not going to be a world for us to run a business if there is no world. There is not going to be a business if we don't have human capital protected with health and, and motivated and engaged in, in driving the company. So I, I, I do think that it, this crisis, again, it is teaching all of us important lessons about how we prioritize things, how, what's the role of uh, corporations, how we better partner with local authorities and health authorities, how, again, this whole notion and discussion about should we prioritize uh, public health versus economic growth. Well, at the end of the day, we needed to figure that out both. It's not either or. We absolutely need to protect public health. Uh, there is not even a question, but I do think that it is possible to drive economic growth in a safer environment in a way that we gradually you know, bring the economy and, 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 and make the circularity of the economy without compromising uh, 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 public health. So it's not about either or, but it's about figuring it out together, working together, and how we find the right answers. Thank you very much. Uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, a question about uh, the, the uh, impact that this pandemic is having, particularly on the rights of women and girls. This is something we, we discussed uh, in, in uh, a, a session a couple of uh, academies ago, a rise in gender-based violence, um, how, how concerned are you about this, about this impact in particular? Well, I'm very concerned and we have had a lot of webinars discussing about this because uh, I mean, on one hand, as you just mentioned, we have seen the rising levels of uh, domestic violence, violence against women when they are in confinement with abusive partners and, and the numbers are really impressive how many reports and allegations have doubled. So there's a lot of things countries have been doing from countries that have like Spain and, and, and Portugal that define that the, the services for women who are victims of violence should be considered essential and should the centers for support. Uh, and so they can, the women have a place to go in case of, of a huge violence in other places like in France, they have a sort of a rented hotel so women can go to a safe place because for some women, we're telling them stay at home, be safe, 
but it's not a safe place to be. So that's why, on the other hand, we have all the impact of women that, as I mentioned before, they usually in many countries, 70, 75% of uh, informal workers are female. And many of the, those work at daily basis. I mean, they have to go sell their products at the market with the lockdowns, they have nowhere to go. With a curfew, if they don't respect it, they will go into prison. Uh, so uh, I think uh, the other issue is that women, uh, the majority of many households in the world don't have water. And of course, it's great to hear from Roberto of the soap, where we even included in the humanitarian response, soap within the package of, uh, of food, food, essential food for, for more vulnerable places as well. So um, I would say from the point of view of the, of the job losses, uh, many SMEs are, 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 are women as well on the informal sector. Many migrants and refugees, this have, will be have a, a, a even huge problems. When women don't have water, what they do, they go miles and miles away to fetch water from the houses, putting in danger their safety, their rape many times, and also the health uh, possibilities. So, so I would say we have clear notion that it affects uh, much more. And on the other hand, the other important issue is 70% or more of health workers are female. And, and have, of course, a great exposure to the risk of getting a COVID-19. Even though until now, I have to say, uh, the tolls, the, the red shows that uh, even though, I don't know if the amounts of women that are infected versus men, because we don't know how many people had contact because testing has not been um, uh, very uh, important. So we don't know the, the, the real situation, how many people has been infected. But we know people who have been, uh, been ill. But on those, the, the death tolls are bigger on men than on women right now. I mean, it's like 40, 60, or 30, 70%, depending on the country. So uh, I would say the majority of the problems affect disproportionately women and girls. But of course, um, of course, there is a concern on FAO and WFP, a World Food Program and um, Food and Agriculture. Uh, organization that uh, this could lead also lead to climate change in some places to food insecurity and that much more people will be with famine and usually what we see is that women are the last that they eat they prefer to, to uh, they prioritize the children the husband and so on so i would say there's a lot of clear information that women are disproportionately affected and that's why we made it a secretary general uh, made a call us as well they created a guidance given information and, and recommendations, specific recommendations to each government, what to do in, in each case. Thank you. Thank you, High Commissioner. We're going we're gonna to wrap up now. We're getting to the, uh, uh, to the end of the, uh, of the program. Um, uh, Mr. Marquez, uh, maybe I can just ask you to make a final comment about, uh, about uh, this, this um, impact on, on women and girls in particular. I believe as a company, Natura and Co have have uh, prioritized that issue uh, as one of your initiatives in this area. And we've heard, uh, we've heard from the High Commissioner that she's a, a strategic optimist, that the, the minister is a practical optimist. What kind of optimist uh, uh, would you say that you are? Uh, so starting maybe a, a more pragmatic optimistic uh, uh, in terms of seeing you know what's happening and also trying to be you know balanced in terms of what we need to do uh, I, I would say that the, the topic of domestic violence to build on on the high commissioner point is such a high priority for us right uh, we are a company that for the most part work with uh, a lot of consultants and representatives, over 6 million of them across the globe. And we are seeing this uh, uh, incredible uh, uh, unintended consequence of the uh, uh, self-distance and isolation, which is this increase in domestic violence. Uh, we are seeing numbers that are pretty concerning. And, 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 and as a result of that, we have committed to uh, uh, over a $1 million from the Avon Foundation to help some of the uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, organizations that are more you know, connected with those women and children and how to protect them. And we created a global campaign across of a four brands that is hashtag isolated but not alone. And it's really a call to action to give them opportunity to call out, uh, to uh, look for help and search for help 
but most important to tell them that they are not alone, that uh, uh, self-isolation or self-distance doesn't mean that we are not thinking about them and, and, and most important, creating opportunities for them uh, uh, to break the cycle. So it is something uh, uh, that we are very committed to do it and, and help to continue partner with UN in, in, in that matter then. Well, thank you very much. Um, Hi, Commissioner, uh, one minute, uh, final reflections from you on, on, on how we can uh, protect the most vulnerable. So first of all, uh, at the companies, they do have to do a human rights due diligence to identify where the problems are, which are the vulnerable people, and what are the kind of measures that they need to take. But of course, we all know who the vulnerable people are. And as we mentioned, women and, and, and girls, but also older people, people living with disabilities, LGBTI communities, um, uh, indigenous groups, uh, human rights defenders, and so on. So, so I think a lot can be done. And let me just please, please tell me what one little thing on women. We are every day in the most part of the world, people applaud the health workers, and the majority are women. We have seen that countries led by women have done very good to the, to the pandemic. So I also hope that this pandemic has a positive uh, result, has a, a change, a change, a cultural change on the importance that the world is given to women, the acknowledgement, and of course, the place they can roll and they can contribute. Thank you. Thank you, High Commissioner. And over to you in Bangladesh, Minister. Just one minute from you. Thank you for staying up late to join uh, this conversation. Uh, one minute from you on your final reflections. We, we can't hear you, Minister. You're, you're on, on mute, I think. Well, we'll we'll uh, we'll carry on and and just uh, finish by uh, I'd like to finish by thanking our our, our panelists uh, Michelle Bachelet, the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, thank you from the government of Bangladesh, His Excellency Anasol Haq, the Minister for Law, Justice, and Parliamentary Affairs, and uh, Roberto Marquez, the Executive Chairman and Group CEO of Natura and Co. Thank you for joining us. Uh, there's a link in the chat box to register for the next week's session on global cooperation for crisis response. We look forward to hearing from a sustainable business leader and SDG advocate, Paul Polman. We'll have the executive director of the Wallace Global Fund, Ellen Dorsey, and a special envoy to the World Health Organization's Director General on COVID-19, Dr. David Nabarro. Uh, this crisis underlines the need for strong institutions, multilateralism, as we've heard, and global partnerships. So we will ask uh, all our speakers about the bold leadership that's needed at both the national and global level to combat the crisis and work towards a more sustainable future. So next week's session will take place two hours earlier at 8 a.m. Eastern on Tuesday, the 5th of March. So uh, uh, we hope that everybody stays safe. Thank you for joining us. Goodbye. Goodbye.